Hello everyone, it's Danny Haye here for the SLA Europe podcast. Today I'm joined by Helen Clegg from AT Kearney. And last year um, I met her actually at the online information conference. And we talked about her article which she wrote in the January 2011 um, VIP magazine, which was entitled Building an Effective Knowledge Management Program. And today I would like to uh, talk to Helen about that uh, journey. Welcome, Helen. Hi, Danny. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I was really intrigued by your article because basically you, you, you wrote about your journey in knowledge management. So could you tell us a bit about your, your organization? Sure. So, Danny, just to, to preface the, the podcast, uh, I am the Knowledge Team Director for AT Kearney Procurement and Analytics Solutions Unit. And the unit that I'm Knowledge Director for, Knowledge Team Director for, concentrates on procurement. So, the consultants are interested in procurement information so that, that they can offer procurement consulting to uh, clients. So, that's the uh, area in the organization uh, which I work in, and I have a team of uh, four people who are based in Chicago and San Francisco who work with me to provide the knowledge services that our consultants in our unit need. And um, you, in your article, you explain the the reason why you started to look into knowledge management. Could you tell us a bit about that background? Yeah, so Denny, what we did is, uh, you know, if we talk about the, the problems and challenges uh, people face when building an effective knowledge management program, we really started to think about this because we had the team in place for a fair few years and knowledge management is just really, you know, it's a, it's a tricky subject. And so we started to think about what are the problems and challenges to building an effective program and how can we do things differently? And here are the things that I'd like to share that we saw as, as, as challenges. The first one that we saw was that while companies talk about the importance of, of knowledge management or KM, what we find, and I think you probably agree with this, is a lot of KM teams or departments that try and implement KM within the organizations are often regarded as back office functions, and they're separated really from the core areas of the business rather than embedded in the business. So that was sort of one problem that mm -hmm. we have faced and that we saw and that we think is common. The second one is that Many organizations think about knowledge management really from a purely technological perspective. So they think it's about having a great big database full of documents. And if you look at the number of quote unquote KM systems out there that vendors are pushing, you know, that, that really shows you that there's these vendors out there saying, you know, we've got this database, it will sort, solve all your KM issues. But for us, what we realized was that it's really not just about technology. Technology is nice, but it's only a part of the solution. So that was sort of the second challenge or problem that we saw that we faced. And third, if you want an effective knowledge management program, you have to provide users with tools that are easy to use and that mm -hmm. they want to use. And for me, that was really, really important. So the tools have to be easy to use. You don't need necessarily an introduction uh, or, or a training course on how to use the tool. And you, it's got to be a tool that people say, yeah, you know, I can do that and I, I, I want to, to use that tool. So those were the, the, th the three sort of the challenges that we saw to, to building an effective program within our, within our unit. And was it recognized that this was something that, that needed to be done? Was it like a yeah. business driver to, to you know, look more into knowledge management? Yeah, I think that for us, it was a case of we needed to be more embedded and what can we do to make ourselves more embedded and show that we actually help drive client value. That's what it's about. It's about how do we how do we serve our clients? How do we make things better for them? Um, so, so that's really what ultimately drives everything in the unit and everything in the firm. It's about serving clients and meeting the client's needs. Mm -hmm. And I think you're talking about you're you're working at a consulting firm. So I'm thinking, you know, your asset is is your the the knowledge in the range of your consultants that your collective memory is what you're trying to you know, uh, you know sell to your clients. So it's almost like a a core process, I would think. Right. Right. Correct. 
Yeah. And in your your article, you briefly mentioned the journey that you went through. So mm -hmm. what was the transformation, if you had to summarize it? Where did you start? So, Denny, about three years ago, we, we started to change the way we thought about knowledge management. And I think what we realized is it, as I said before, it needed to be more integrated and embedded into the business process, into the core things that we do for our clients. So we started to think about how we're going to transform. And it, what we did is we, we the whole process of transforming what my team did revolved around three key, I'll call them revelations. So the yeah. first one mentioned before, it's not just about technology. It's about getting people to share what they've learned on their projects and how do you get them to share effectively. So a question, how do, why do people share so readily on Facebook or take time to update their profile on LinkedIn? It's a really interesting question, and I think the reason is because these tools, they're, they're really intuitive to use. I mean, mm -hmm. no one gives you a guided tour of, of, of Facebook. You don't have to attend a training session or, you know, do a little online tutorial to use Facebook. It's intuitive, and mm -hmm. it's easy to use, and it's fun. And the same for LinkedIn. It's easy, and it's intuitive, and it's, you know, fairly fun to do. So tools and processes have to be intuitive. Second uh, the second revelation for us was that documents don't equal knowledge, and that is really important. So from my experience and the work I've done in the field, a lot of knowledge management systems, it's all about collecting documents and documents and storing documents in vast document repositories. And for us, what we thought about was, you know, yeah, you do need some documents. I'm not saying that you don't, but documents don't equal sharing knowledge. There's other forms of, of sharing which are really important. If you think about um, David Gertin and his knowledge cafes, that's yes. talking it's storytelling so we started to look at other forms of content and for us that other form of content was about wiki pages and also podcasts so audio and this whole this whole concept of storytelling and and conversations and then the third the third revelation was that, that any transformation takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can have these great big visions and ideas, but you're not going to reach it in a year. You're going to, it's going to take a couple of years to, you know, to get that vision on the road and, and realize that you're actually on this transformational journey. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I'm in a similar position as, as you were as an knowledge manager embedded in an organization. And as my manager told me when I started, you know, change, change is a journey, not an event. It's not like, right. you know, as of January 1st, you know, the world will change. No, you know, it, it's, right. you know, it takes time and you have to persist and maybe try different angles to, to make it work because, you know, the world around changes. And in your article, I think the, the, the main point there is that you were describing some pillars that, that you built your KM program on. Could you just mention a few pillars as examples for the listeners? Yeah, sure. So, Denny, what we did is we came up with a framework uh, to explain the knowledge management process that we wanted, that we developed and, and thought up. So we designed a framework and, you know, there's a couple of reasons why we called it a framework. One is that a framework is actually a, a useful concept for for thinking through what you're trying to do so and it, you can visualize it you have this you can you have to draw it out so you have something you have a tool you have something that you can visualize so it's really useful for that purpose but also frameworks um, resonate with our stakeholders because we're in a consulting environment and there's a lot of, there's a lot of frameworks used out there so framework you know it, it it um, was useful for us because it gave us something visual to look at and, and hang our knowledge management processes on. And it was also uh, a useful tool that resonated with our stakeholders. So we have this framework with eight pillars. The framework is called the House of Knowledge. Uh, and again, this resonates with our stakeholders. And we have eight pillars and the eight pillars are sort of interconnected um, and they all hang together. Um, and just to pick out a few examples, uh, one pillar for us is called distillation. And distillation is about distilling the core knowledge out of all these documents that we might come across or that project teams want to share. And what we try and do is take out the, the real you know, distill down the essence of that information. What's the key information that can be shared in a more useful and centralized format? So what we'll do is we'll distill, we'll take a PowerPoint deck, 
and we'll distill it into, say, a, a fairly long wiki page with, say, three slides that have been completely uh, cleansed and that can be then used as templates. So instead of getting, say, uh, a 30-page deck of... Which no one reads. Which no one reads and you can't really update it. You get um, a wiki page, which is easy to read and re easy to update because anyone with the right permissions can go in and edit or add to that page. And then attached or linked to that wiki page, you've got, say, three or four key slides, which give extra context to that wiki page so that's about distillation it's about taking a lot of information that's in a lot of decks and distilling it down to something that's more dynamic that's some something that more people can comment on and 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 rate for example so the wiki that we've built is in now in SharePoint 2010, which mm. has uh, rating functionality. So theoretically, our users, well, actually not theoretically, users can go in and they can rate content. Okay. So you can, say, you can basically you know, let, let, let the best stuff rise right. to the top. Oh, that's good. right. That's right. Exactly. And the, the content that's not so good or that doesn't get rated, it then drifts down to the bottom and you can then show that this content has not been used and you can then do two things you can go to the owner of the content and say your content has not been used would you like to update it or this content hasn't been used for x amount of weeks or months mm -hmm. is it worth keeping and then yeah. you can be more radical and take it away so that was that's to us that is one of the pillars that's really important it's about distilling the most useful bits of content and making them more readily available Another pillar that I'll just briefly comment on is about different forms of knowledge. And this really throws back to your earlier question. Um, and it's about different ways of of con different forms of content. So for us, it was about this light bulb moment where content is not just about documents. So audio content, stories, how do you... You can share knowledge by talking with people. So what we did is over, I think it was about three or four years ago now, we started a, a, a podcast series. And actually, the idea for the podcast series came out of attending the SLA conference in Denver in 2007. And I went to this podcast workshop and I thought it was a really good idea. So, you know, let's try it. Let's take that conference idea and try it in the work environment. And I have to say that when we started it, we, we had no idea if it was going to be a success. But I think with any innovation, you've just got to try. If you have an idea, let's, you know, let's, let's go try it. So we started this series and it's actually worked really well. And to date, we've got 80 podcasts out there. And we, again, when we started three, four years ago, we just um, did the podcast and we recorded a conference call. We had a standard intro and a standard outro and a bit of music. And what we did is we uh, made the podcast available internally. But now what we've done is we've realized that some of the podcasts we can make available externally to people like people who might want to come and go through our recruiting process and join the company. So look at, you know, if you're looking to, to recruit and it also helps market the company. So it performs other functionalities that we never thought would happen, which is really good. Um, it's, it's branding. It gives it's, you it's branding. Profile. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, that's sort of like additional benefits that we never thought about. But again, what it's great is it's, it's another form of sharing and storytelling. And also it can make some rather dry topics much more interesting. So it can bring topics that are pretty you know, maybe just, just dry and, and, and not that interesting. It can bring them to life because you have a couple of people talking about them. Yeah. So, you hear a tone of voice. You right, get right. excited. Yep. So, you know, you're not going to get the methodologies, you're not going to get the PowerPoint decks, but at the end of the day, if you hear someone talking about a methodology or a concept, you can always follow up with them later yeah. and get that information. So, uh, you know, the, this pillar for us in the framework was about different forms of knowledge. So it was a, getting away from the fact that knowledge is not just about documents. It's a broader, you have to think broader than that. Mm -hmm. Um and if I pick another pillar, um, let's say maybe I'll pick syndication. So, again, that's important for us, and it's about uh, helping clients and driving client value. So if we take 
content that we've distilled. So if we take really useful content that I talked about earlier, that we've distilled into a more useful format onto a wiki page. And if you take audio content in a podcast, we can syndicate that content to potential clients if they're interested in having that content, because those those clients will also undoubtedly have SharePoint 2010 or SharePoint 2007. And because we're working on the same platform, we can push that content to them if they would like to receive it. So if you think about it, it's content that we are creating that the knowledge team, my team helps consultants repackage and uh, put together in a different format that is available then for clients. Yeah. And they can integrate it in their end, right? You don't have Correct. to push it and they have to go look for it. Right. Basically, your right. brand or your knowledge is just in their work stream. Yeah. It, it, it's pushed. It can be automatically yeah. pushed if they would like to receive it. Right, right. So that's sort of where we're driving to. So to me, that shows that we're adding value. That's what we're trying to do to to show the the unit that the team, it's vital to have a knowledge team that can reach out and work with consultants to build really good content, to distill that content, to make it available in different forms that clients would like to receive. Yeah. And that's the value. Yeah, and I think that's what we're all looking for. How can we add value Besides, you know, the traditional rules, and I think what you're doing is 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 a natural extension of that, and you're, you know, you're not afraid of taking a chance, and you know, this this worked out pretty pretty well. So, looking back, you know, last question to 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 wrap this conversation up. If you look back, you've been doing this for a couple of years now. What, in hindsight, would you have done differently? Oh, Denny, hindsight is always such <laughs> a good thing. Yeah, I love the question. So. Uh, a couple of things I think we would have done differently. I think we would have thought about governance and guidelines more sooner than we did because governance is really important. You need to have some control over what you're doing in a program or a framework that you're going to try and embed. So that is important. So think about governance and governance and, and guidelines. Uh, don't let everyone go out and do their own thing. That, that doesn't work. So that's certainly one thing. I think the second element is that my team could have done uh, or could have benefited earlier from some SharePoint training because really we were very much given a SharePoint sandbox, as they call it, and said, well, go and play and have a look and see what it does. But that's not always easy to do. Sometimes you just need um, to go on a professional course where they say this is what it can do. These are the benefits these are the advantages and disadvantages of this system. So that would have been good to know the full capabilities of the system before we were told to you know, use it as our, our default uh, technology platform, if you will. So, you know, the sooner a team can get some training on a tool, the better, because then you can explore what it can do, what it can't do, and you're not just discovering step by step. So I think that is important. So those are sort of two things that are, are useful to point out that – um, would have been certainly would have been better for us, um, you know, now now three, four years down the line. But, you know, hindsight, as I say, is a great thing and uh, we can always learn from it. Absolutely. And now what but are I, people who, who want to do this can, you know, right, avoid that. Right. And I think, you know, but what I what I would uh, like to finish on is just that I think that knowledge teams that are implementing tools and designing tools what they need to remember is that if you want people to share and participate, which is really what every organization wants, you have to make those tools and technologies easy, easy for people uh, to use. And you have to make them engaging and you have to make the tools you have to you have to put tools there that people want to use. And, and again, I'll go back to Facebook and LinkedIn. Why do people constantly update their LinkedIn profile. And it's not just about networking. It's easy to do. Mm. And again, Facebook, you know, it's easy to do. You don't need a tutorial to uh, to tell you how to use Facebook. So I think intuitive, you know, those tools that knowledge teams are trying to put in place, they have to be intuitive. Very wise words to end this uh, discussion. But Helen, I really want to thank you for spending the time with me and our listeners. Um, for those who have listened to the podcast who would like to know more about Helen and the article she wrote, on the blog post of the SLA Europe blog, there are the links to Helen's profile and the article we've just been talking about. Helen, once again, thank you. Thanks, Danny. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.